really, uh, really uh, great uh, pleasure to be here. I started out as a political economist. I used to compare the Taiwan's uh, industrial policy and its industrial organization of consequences with Korea, and also compare the Mexico with the Brazil and uh, Thailand with Malaysia. I mean, there's some sort of parallels between these three pairs. Uh, but uh, uh, about 20 years ago, I switched my attention away from that uh, to focus on the political change, uh, particularly in East Asia. Uh, the East Asia is a very interesting place, interesting region, if you compare it uh, with uh, other regions of uh, new democracy. Uh, you can see that uh, this is the, a very challenging place to study. It's the uh, democratization in the post-World uh, 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 no, post War II era uh, began in the 1970s, started out in South Europe. Uh, you got wholesale transformations there. Uh, Greece, uh, the uh, Portugal, Spain, and so on. Uh, it eventually uh, moved to the uh, the Latin America, and again there, uh, all Latin American countries uh, became democratic eventually. Uh, after that, uh, the uh, the wave of the uh, democratization hit the uh, Central and Eastern Europe, and again you got wholesale transformation there. Uh, literally, every country is now democratic there. When this uh, wave of democratization hit Asia, its uh, result, its uh, consequences vary, so a checkered, it's a checkered one. Uh, roughly speaking, half of the countries there are still non-democratic. Half of the countries there uh, the, uh, are democracy. So you, you, you know that uh, this is regions where the uh, authoritarian regimes uh, continues uh, to coexist with the uh, sort of democratic regimes. It's very, very different from other regions. Uh, it is also different from other regions in the sense that uh, people in the new democracies there are particularly unhappy with the democracies that they got. Uh, if you look at you know, how the uh, people sort of respond to the surveys, uh, you can see that uh, folks there have more criticism than praise you know, for their democracy, uh, which is quite different from the uh, other part of the uh, the uh, other regions of uh, new democracies that I just mentioned. Uh, probably the only place that it can be compared to East Asia in this respect is Latin America. Uh, but even in Latin America, there are more folks there praising and so sort of kind of supporting and indeed uh, very kind of nicely sort of treat their newly created system than you know those uh, critics uh, that you can find there. Uh, so you indeed uh, see that uh, uh, more kind of complaints and the uh, criticism in uh, in Asia than in other parts of the, uh, of the uh, new democracies. So it is a puzzle. Uh, so that's a puzzle that I'd like to sort of solve in my articles here, which I presented in the Western Centers a few months ago. Uh, the other side of the puzzle is that uh, if you look uh, afar from, say, Washington, D.C., uh, into Asia, uh, if you look uh, from the sort of outside in, you can see that uh, we folks here, as a kind of external judges, or say external referees, we have uh, many good things to say about East Asian democracy. Uh, we give them <laughs> very nice uh, high scores. Yeah. But if you go to Asia to ask folks there, they're pretty critical of themselves, <laughs> of their system. So you have some sort of gaps there as well, uh, which is that uh, you know, a small card, uh, not small card, the uh, uh, report cards uh, given by say the uh, uh, organizations here. Uh, the uh, freedom house in New York City and so uh, for Asia it's pretty high uh, in comparison with the uh, report cards for other part of the, uh, the uh, new democracies, other part of the world, you know, where do you find a new emerging democracy. Uh, and yet uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, survey studies uh, done by the Asian folks there uh, in those uh, new democracies uh, tend to indeed give uh, their governments very low scores. Uh, so you can see that uh, there's another side of the sort of puzzle to solve. How come they're so so critical? They're so you know sort of uh, dissatisfied with the uh, their own the systems. While we here looking from afar, you know, we tend to <laughs> somehow give them uh, some sort of positive assessment. So that's a puzzle I want I want to set, I want I want to start the uh, uh, solve here. So uh, let me recap a little bit. You know, there's sort of more sort of complaints and then praise you know, about their democracy. Uh, they see their sort of democracy is kind of flawed. Uh, it's kind of the uh, and, and sometimes even unacceptable. 
democracies are here, yes, in Taiwan, South Korea, Singapore, uh, uh, Thailand, uh, uh, Mongolia, uh, and also Philippines, the Philippines, and also Indonesia. Uh, seven or eight countries that are covered here. Okay. Uh, there are uh, flawed, there are uh, not, sometimes they are even unacceptable. Un 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 okay. So it is a puzzle. Why is that? Why? And also, there's a third dimension of the puzzle here. Which is that uh, if you go to Asia and ask the people how and how, how how happy you are with your life, uh, most of the folks there will say that uh, you know, we are pretty happy, we are pretty satisfied. Uh, but uh, when you ask about the political question, uh, what about your political life? They are very unhappy. So you have another asymmetry there. So we have a uh, three surface sides of the sort of puzzles uh, here to solve. Uh, three asymmetries, if you like. The asymmetry between Asian democracies and other democracies in other parts of the world. Okay, uh, the asymmetries between, say, the uh, uh, the general satisfactions, you know, with the uh, uh, with the uh, with life and the uh, their sort of critical, uh, the uh, critical of their sort of politics and, and so. And third asymmetry is between the uh, the uh, their feelings and their sentiments and their self assessments and our assessments from above. So you got three sort of asymmetries here. And uh, I, I think this uh, form, these are uh, three asymmetries uh, form a very interesting puzzle to solve. How come you know Asian folks are not so happy you know, with their politics, uh, pretty happy with their life, okay? And how come you know we are somehow satisfied you know with their political performance there, uh, but they themselves you know as some sort of, a kind of customers or clients of the systems there are not satisfied, okay? And thirdly, you know, compare Asia with other regions. You know, how come Asia seems to be you know so you know, they are, so, they are also sort of, like, they are grumpy, uh, they are grumpy, you know, about their democracy than their counterparts in, say, Latin America, uh, Southern Europe, uh, East and Central Europe. Okay, that's my sort of kind of the uh, puzzle there. <coughs> I will do uh, three things to answer these puzzles. Uh, first, I'm going to sum up the uh, sort of the uh, seven nations of surveys, uh, which uh, allow us to see you know how unhappy they are with their systems. And uh, I would also uh, compare the uh, attitudinal surveys conducted there uh, with our objective assessment. Okay. And finally, I wanted to present uh, three possible explanations in you know, why you know you ha we we have this kind of <coughs> gap here gaps between our assessments and their assessment and so on. Okay, so uh, first, uh, our survey studies uh, results, and second, the, uh, uh, the uh, comparisons between the uh, survey studies there and our sort of objectives of uh, the uh, assessments here. And finally, I will present uh, three hypotheses to explain you know, uh, why you, know, you have this kind of gaps. Okay, first, seven nation surveys. Uh, basically, it's done in the 2006, that's the second survey, and the first one was done in the uh, 2004. Yeah. Uh, seven nations covered, uh, the, uh, uh, as I mentioned, South Korea, Taiwan, uh, Mongolia, and the uh, uh, Singapore, Singapore's kind of quasi-democracies, and the uh, uh, Thailand, Indonesia, and the, uh, the Philippines, yes. Okay. Uh, basically, survey reveals uh, three things, three, three big points. The uh, so first, first one is that people still prefer the uh, democracies to other forms of government, authoritarian, dictatorships, the theocratic regimes, or whatever, whatever you have. Uh, democracies still preferred uh, as an idea. We still want to stay with that. Okay, so. Uh, in other words, they are not dumping their democracies yet. Uh, they are still committed to the sort of democracies. You know, as, uh, they are committed to supporting sort of democracies you know, as an idea. Okay, but immediately they argue that the democracy that we have, not democracies as an idea, the democratic system that we have is deeply flawed. Uh, it's bad. Uh, they are dissatisfied with democracy in practice, if you like. Okay, so that's the first uh, finding. Okay. Finding number two uh, is that the main sources of uh, dissatisfactions uh, is the bad governance, or if you like, a low quality of democracies. Okay. Uh, a lot of flaws, uh, 
something to do with uh, the way that uh, the, the, uh, these polities uh, uh, are governed. Okay, and if you go into sort of another layers of analysis, you can see that you know how the, the sort of causal links that run in their mind goes like this: they perceive some sort of flaws in their systems, and then they develop some sort of uh, some psychological dissatisfaction with the systems. And that, uh, turned, that led them to uh, uh, answer the questions regarding the level of support that they would like to lend you know, to their democracy. So you got that sort of causal links there. Fairly uh, clearly established you know, through these sort of questions there. Right? That's the second sort of the uh, findings. The third finding is that uh, the uh, good, governments, uh, good governance to uh, the uh, people at large in the Asian democracies you know, it's more important than the good economic performance. Uh, and this is kind of a <laughs> different from the uh, China. Uh, the uh, e economic performance is important, but even more important than that uh, to uh, folks uh, in the Asian democracies is good governance. Okay, clean governments, uh, fairness, uh, and that sort of thing uh, really matters uh, to the uh, folks at large here. It's not the uh, GDP growth rate. It's not the sort of kind of the, uh, your uh, foreign exchange reserve. It's not the income distribution and so on. It's good governance, good governance. Okay, fairness and uh, that sort of thing. Okay, so basically, uh, surveys of uh, the uh, our studies uh, uh, reveal these uh, three things. Okay, and let me go back to the second of the uh, uh, the points of the service funding uh, to uh, give you some sort of details about you know how we sort of, you know identify the problems and, and so on. Uh, basically, uh, the surveys includes uh, eight uh, batteries of questions, eight bundles of questions there, uh, eight uh, uh, clusters of questions there, uh, and, and they have to do with uh, first bundle has to do with rule of law, okay. Second second bundle of question has to do with clear uh, the clean government, and the third one has to do with the democratic process, electoral process there. Uh, when it comes to the first uh, the uh, uh, battery of questions. Uh, Almost universally in Asia, uh, you see that uh, people answer question positively. Yes, we do have rule of law here, okay. but immediately, particularly in the case of Taiwan, uh, in the case of Outer Mongol uh, Mongolia, and to some extent in the case of the uh, in the case of South Korea, but certainly not in the case of the uh, Singapore, uh, people say. But somehow, rule of law uh, uh, it's uh, sort of subverted by politicians. Uh, it's there. System is there. But uh, somehow it's kind of bypassed, it's some sort of bended. Okay, all right, that's first. Uh, clean governments, yes, we do have clean governments. But there are other things that we don't like about the government. And uh, occasionally uh, you have, uh, not, not really occasionally, quite often you have uh, indeed unclean politicians. Uh, indeed, therefore, the governments almost universally today, probably with the exception of Singapore, tainted. Okay, so always, you know, they add something there. Yes, you know, clean governments there. Yes, maybe, but you know, we have lots of these sort of crooks, lots of the corrupt officials, and so. Okay. Uh, the third bundle of the question has to do with the uh, sort of uh, democratic the electoral process. Is electoral process question goes like this: fair, okay, uh, competitive, and uh, also uh, the free. Uh, general answer to this: yes, it's fair. Uh, it's free and it's competitive, uh, with the exception of Singapore. Uh, the Singaporean answer this question, you know, in a very kind of uh, kind of the uh, very uh, uh, loaded manners. Uh, it's fair, it's free, but it's not competitive. We all know that Singapore you know, has only one party, significant party, competing in every election, which is the People's Action Party. Okay. The survey questions, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, ba the battery number four has to do with the uh, vertical uh, accountability. Vertical accountability type of questions uh, goes like this. Uh, are you able to throw the uh, rascals out if you're not happy you know, with uh, this group of incumbents? Okay, we just went through that, right, you know, this past election. <laughs> yeah. Are you able to throw the bad guys out uh, at elections? Yes, universally, every country. Okay, uh, the uh, answer is yes, we do. We do have a chance to throw this, so we are able to do it, okay. But we can do nothing about governments in between two elections. Okay, 
Okay, in between two elections. Okay, in between two elections, we are very frustrated. We, all right. So that's a battery. Next battery the question has to do with the horizontal accountability rather than vertical. A horizontal accountability here has to do with checks and balances between different branches of government and also di between different institutions of democracies. Okay. Uh, there, uh, universally, uh, people answer that we do have legislative checks on the administrations, on the executive branch. No question about that. We also have uh, free press. And the only exception here is Singapore. Singapore, you don't have a free press. <laughs> uh, but uh, universally, you know, yes, uh, with exception of Singapore, you, know, uh, you do have a press or sort of kind of the uh, oversight you know, over the government. Okay. Uh, what about the judicial judicial branch? Uh, is judicial branch really able to somehow you know hold these of the uh, uh, the administrations accountable or not? Uh, universally, no. Uh, one exception here. Uh, Singapore. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Next bundle's question has to do with the equalities, you know, in the system. Uh, are everyone uh, is everyone sort of kind of equally treated, you know, kind of treated fairly, uh, fairly or not? Uh, yes, uh, but uh, uh, the there's still pockets of some sort of minorities so, or. You know, not the ethnic minorities, but uh, sort of social minorities. Somehow they have some sort of grievance there. Okay, but most importantly, the last one is that uh, uh, governments uh, in the Asian democracies is perceived as non-responsive to the social societal demands, uh, societal expectations, that sort of thing. Universal, and uh, it's uh, it's 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 very very clear. Therefore, I use the uh, endo. I capitalize you know, this endo things here. It's universal. All right, to sum up, you know, these are eight bundles of questions. Uh, let me say that uh, uh, in the Asian democracies, uh, you still have uh, sort of the uh, popular support, you know, for it, okay, uh, as an idea, okay. But then you have the, the what? You have a support level that is quite alarming because the support level uh, for democracies in Asia is lower than that uh, in the other part of the world where you find the emerging democracy. South America, Eastern Europe, and even in Africa, even in Africa, Africa uh, today is I think there are something like uh, uh, probably thirty or forty democracies there already. Very, very, very young, but uh, people are still quite uh, exuberant, uh, quite uh, supportive of it. Okay. Uh, the only sort of uh, thing that I want to mention here is that Latin America seems to have some problems here. Uh, the uh, but only some Latin American countries, not universal. Uh, some Latin American countries, you know, uh, do show some sort of alarming, some sort of levels of uh, non-support for democracy there. But in Asia, you have a sort of kind of universal, kind of a low level of the support for democracy. Still, pa still beyond the 50 percent, but very, you know, marginally sort of beyond 50 percent. All right. And also, uh, to continue my sort of uh, the summaries of the uh, surveys, uh, the findings, uh, the uh, general speaking, you have what the, uh, the uh, uh, general happiness you know, with life, okay, but uh, uh, political unhappiness. So these two things are in, indeed sort of a vivid contrast, okay. Uh, here I use the, uh, the age and wise of the scores as a benchmark uh, here. Uh, Adrian White is a psychologist teaching at the, uh, uh, some university in Scotland. Uh, he, uh, his uh, database is uh, it's huge. I think it includes uh, probably 120 some countries. And there he used the, uh, uh, both the objective uh, the uh, data and also the subjective <coughs> data. He asked uh, the uh, folks to respond uh, through the attitudinal test. And he also hired a group of scholars you know, to somehow use the uh, some of the objective criteria, such as you know, uh, the uh, hospital beds per thousand, uh, square footage of your house, and uh, that sort of thing, to infer you know, your satisfaction or dissatisfaction with your life. Okay, so uh, there I use uh, Adrian White, and uh, I discovered that uh, the, uh, uh, as I say, Adrian White's the uh, the uh, life uh, satisfaction with life scores is based both on the verifi verifiable facts. And also uh, based on the attitudinal, attitudinal uh, subjectiveness of uh, the evaluation. Okay. And I discovered that uh, the uh, 
uh, for the Asian folks, uh, Asians of democracy, seven democracies that I'm uh, referring to here, uh, ranks very, very high in the global sort of kind of rankings uh, uh, when it comes to the uh, uh, satisfaction with life. They're not satisfaction with politics, okay? As you can see from this uh, the chart here, I slice the 100 some countries into four chunks. Yeah, cl in, I put it in the four uh, clusters. Uh, happiest countries on Earth. Uh, next uh, stop the uh, uh, block. And these are happiest you know, uh, folks uh, uh, down there in the fourth quarter. <coughs> and not so unhappy. So you have uh, sort of four tiers there. Okay. If you look at this, sort of the, uh, uh, you have, uh, of course, uh, uh, five uh, sort of uh, the bundles of countries there. African countries, African democracies, as you say. Uh, East Asia. And then Central and Eastern Europe. And then MENA. Uh, uh, the, the Middle East and the North Africa and then Latin America. Now look at this. Latin American folks seem to be most happy. <laughs> oh, 15 <laughs> countries are covered you know, here, uh, there, right? And then eight, okay? Uh, African countries are very, very unhappy with their life, not with their politics, okay? This is a sort of the uh, satisfaction with life's a score here, okay? Uh, what about the uh, manners? Manners everywhere. There is no patterns there. You have, uh, you know, e almost e equal numbers of uh, the uh, of countries in four uh, categories there. Uh, Central and Eastern Europe are not very happy with their life. Okay, not very happy with their life. Very happy with their politics. Okay, East Asia, pretty happy. Uh, eight countries in the second uh, cluster, five countries the third, and, and this the two in the first quarter. Okay, so generally speaking, you know they are happy with their life. They're not as happy as you can find in Latin America, but but certainly are happier than uh, their counterparts in Africa and in, in Central and Eastern Europe and in the many countries, there is East Asia and, East, uh, and, and, and North African countries. Okay, uh, there's a challenge for you, um, or it's possible for you to solve, you know, how come the uh, uh, Central and Eastern European countries, you know, folks, they are not very happy with their life. Uh, Latin America, in terms of per capita GDP, uh, per capita GDP, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, CEE, Central and Eastern European countries, you know, are higher. They have higher per capita GDP than you know that in the uh, Latin America. You know they're richer. In other words, they're richer, but they are not as happy as the uh, folks in Latin America. Solve that puzzle. So, uh, my point here is just to show you that uh, when it comes to the satisfaction with life in general, okay, East Asian is pretty high. East Asian economy is pretty high. Okay, is the politics that drags them down psychologically? Mm -hmm. All right. So that's the, uh, that's the uh, as I said, there are two side, uh, three sides of puzzle. One is that, you know, generally speaking, they are happy with their life, but they are very unhappy with their politics, with their democracy. Second side of the puzzle here is that we are satisfied, we as a sort of external referees, we are somehow satisfied with their democracy state, but they are not. They are not, okay? We use objective criteria, your press freedom, uh, how well is the you know, sort of democratic process and that sort of thing uh, and, and so all right and we use the uh, the uh, uh, the uh, we I can give you a lot of index there uh, government efficiencies the uh, Gini coefficient uh, freedom house indexes and so Asian democracies run very high very high if you go to New York City you see the freedom house is sort of the ranking right freedom house is in scores there and I believe I have that score here as well Oh, here, okay. Uh, one, uh, one, the set of the uh, objective criteria has to do uh, with the uh, corruption, uh, with the, sort of the uh, due process, if you like, okay? Uh, the process there it goes through if you want to get things done, and so. Uh, Transparency International. Uh, Asians, the, uh, Asia in general is not very, very, very high. Uh, East Asia and Pacific is 3.0. Uh, this ranks from 1 to 10, the higher the better. Uh, if you have 10 here, that means that you are corruption free. You are utterly transparent. Everything is you know, according to the process and so on. Okay? If you have zero, that means that you are bribed every step of your, you know, you are bribed in you know, to get things up. Okay? So between zero and 10. The higher the better. The higher the better. Okay? The higher the better. Uh, if you look at that, you know, well, all this country, all this of uh, the uh, regions where you find the emerging democracies, they are pretty low. They are pretty low. Okay, 
uh, North America, Western Europe, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, and so on, pretty high, something like seven, eight, something, okay? Uh, pretty low, uh, three, five, that sort of thing. But, but, if you look at just uh, seven new democracies that I covered, it's 4.4, the highest, the highest, the best in this group. Okay, so objectively speaking, you know, they are not too bad in comparison with other regions, okay, of new democracy, okay. Same thing can be said about the uh, Freedom House Index, which I don't have it here. Uh, but basic points here, oh, I also have another one, which is the uh, judicial sort of the, uh, the uh, independence. I use the uh, uh, Mr. Voss and Mr. Fells, the, uh, the uh, ranking, uh, uh, their, rank, their sort of benefits is very limited. Uh, it only covers some 50 countries. Uh, it only covers the uh, four countries out of seven that I, you know, I, that I managed to, you know, uh, include in this uh, the uh, talk. Okay, but look at that. You know, they're pretty high. They're high, uh, and this is higher than the uh, Latin America. Okay, so uh, in other words, we folks here, okay, uh, we look at Asian democracies. Their judicial side of the story, their uh, sort of uh, due process that sort of thing. Uh, you know, we, we assign high scores in our report cards, okay? So we, as objectives of a third-party referees, okay, look at the whole, uh, whole things outside in there, okay? We get them high scores. They gave their governments low scores. All right? So, so uh, how do you explain that discrepancies here? Uh, as I said, three discrepancies. One is that you know they are happy with their life, but they are very unhappy with their politics, like democratic politics. And second, you know they are uh, you know quite well evaluated by us here, okay, external referees, but they give their they give their their, their government very low scores, okay. <coughs> and the third, of course, you know they are indeed you know their their support of the uh, the uh, democratic government is substantially low, support level is substantially low, you know, then that you know, in other sort of uh, part of the uh, the uh, uh, in other regions of uh, emerging democracies. How do you explain that? How come Asians, you know, folks, you know, are so critical, are so unhappy, uh, have high degree of political discontent, if you like, okay, with their democracies? I would like to advance uh, three possible reasons, reason, uh, uh, reasons uh, three possible sort of hypotheses, if you like. Okay, the first possible reason is that Asian democracies are really bad, and maybe we miss that. We looking at the whole things from outside in. Okay, maybe they are indeed the you know, Asian democracy has less too much to be desired. Okay, uh, Asian democracies may. Uh, uh, Maybe there, but uh, perhaps it's not, you know, uh, sort of the uh, well perfected yet. Okay, uh, and to some extent that may well be true. Maybe we are missing something here. Uh, if you look at the Asian democracies uh, uh, from sort of comparative perspective, okay, sometimes you just got a feeling that you know many things are going wrong there. While in other region, okay, something's going on not so nicely. But you know, occasionally, you know, you have these bad things here and there. Uh, take the example of the uh, uh, military coup, coup d'état. Okay, uh, in the whole Latin America, new democracies there. There's only one episode, right? One episode, which is the uh, uh, Honduras, uh, no. uh, Guatemala, Guatemala. Okay, in Asia, okay, out of seven countries that are covered here, you have got uh, military coup in Thailand <laughs> twice. <laughs> Uh, you've got uh, numerous attempted coups in the Philippines. You have alleged the coup, and there are some, some rumors about coup in even in Taiwan, <laughs> really, at one point of time. Okay, and the Indonesia also, you know, kind of a, you know, it's also very cool sort of a, it's kind of a prom sort of country state. Okay, so in other regions, you know, you have bad things here and there, but somehow in Asia, you have bad things somehow everywhere. Uh, social protests, another example. Uh, social police, okay, uh, not accepting the electoral outcomes, okay, go into the streets, take into the streets, and then camp there, okay, Thailand most well, known. Taiwan at one point in time, Korea also, you know, all the time, uh, Indonesia less so, okay, Philippines also, all the time, where do you find that sort of thing in Latin America, no, okay, so maybe there's some bad things there that we fail to capture, 
Okay, and uh, I suppose that uh, if you have bad things there, social protests, you know, unended social protests, uh, corruptions, uh, say coup d'etat, that sort of thing, okay, it captures people's attention. And uh, here uh, in social sciences, we have the, a very prominent sort of a theory that is uh, gaining some sort of a currency here, which is called prospect theory. Uh, prospect theory, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's kind of a, a rising star, if you like, in social sciences. Basically, it says that uh, uh, we actors in whatever domains we are in, uh, stock market, or in, say, the uh, public electoral space, and so on, we hate to lose more than we love to gain. We hate to lose more than we love to gain. That's one, the proposition of the prospect theory. And second, the uh, aspect of the pro prospect theory is that we pay in, we, we, we pay some unequal amount of attention to the uh, sort of different kind of em events. Even, you know, these events uh, can be randomly, kind of, will be randomly distributed along this uh, spectrum. Very bad event and very good event. Not so good event, not so bad event. Neutral event. Each, you know, you have five, five or 20, 20, 20 there. But we pay special attention. We are only attentive to either very bad or very good. Okay, we are actually inattentive to anything in between. So apply the theory to Asia. If you have you know, one corruption case here, and literally, uh, you know, every country is the uh, every the leaders, uh, every the democracies in the uh, in this region uh, has the sort of kind of leadership of corruption case there. Uh, Chen Shui-bian in Taiwan is now in jail. Uh, the uh, two or three the uh, former presidents of the uh, of the uh, Korea were indicted. Okay, uh, two actual were exiled, internally exiled. Uh, uh, Estrada's in the Philippines was also indicted. Uh, Taksin's was also somehow you know attended, and so all right, almost everywhere. everywhere. If you have an episode like that, like that, you pay full attention to it. Mm -hmm. Therefore, of course, you are very unsatisfied with your. Politics with your democracy, so that may be sort of one entertainable, entertainable idea, sort of hypothesis there. That indeed you do have a lot of flaws in the Asian democracy. That's the first hypothesis I'm looking into. Second possible reason is that, uh, well, maybe second possible reasons, uh, second hypothesis is antithetical to the first one, uh, and, and the first one they are not uh, compatible. So if the second one is correct, the first one you know, should be re refuted. The second possible reason is that, well, an Asian democracy is not that bad. Corruption, you know, if you expose, it's good. You know, if you don't expose it, then it's going to, you, know, uh, you are going to see you know, the system sort of rotting away. Okay? Uh, corruption is it, exposed. That means that you, know, you can correct it. You can you know, improve your democracy. So it's a good thing. So maybe democracy there is not not really that bad, okay? It's just that you know, people there are very demanding. Uh, probably they have, uh, they use a sort of a kind of, you know, uh, the very interesting sort of the benchmark to adjudicate, to judge their democracy. I think they use their past, okay, to adjudicate their present. And also I think they use the neighboring countries, highly performing, for example, Ch Chinese, uh, the, uh, Ch Ch sorry, Chinese regime, okay, uh, <clears throat> to somehow uh, assess you know, the performance of their government. And they discovered that, hey, China, not democratic, yes, but somehow very effective. Okay. The, uh, the uh, say, food poison case, you know, people got run it up and executed it in, you know, <laughs> very short periods of time, okay. And we got this uh, sort of kind of democracy here, you know, dragging on and on for, so the, uh, uh, for all kind of tri trial things. And therefore, somehow, second hypothesis here says that you tend to see, you know, what's so right, what is so good in the past, okay, and what is so wrong in the, in the present time. Asians of the uh, uh, democracies used to have what? Very <coughs> wonderful sort of kind of uh, performance in the past. So you have some sort of nostalgia. Uh, in the old days, we did not have, in Taiwan and South Korea, we did not have in a democracy. But we did have good, uh, benign, authoritarian rulers. Pa Chong Hee, Jiang Jing Guo. These guys, you know, they are clean. They were clean. They were effective. They are not democratic. They were minority democratic. But somehow they got things done. And they are fair-minded. 
uh, Jiang Jin, who actually rounded up his nephew, you know, for some sort of small corruption things, and put him in the jail. Okay. So you use your own past as a benchmark to adjudicate your present. You also use highly performing neighbors to adjudicate your present government. So you become very dissatisfied you know, with your current government. That's the second possible reason. <clears throat> The third possible reason, and after this, you know, I will conclude. <coughs> the uh, <coughs> the second, the third possible reason is somehow compatible with the second one, but uh, with different principles. Here, I am hypothesizing that uh, maybe the uh, Asian sort of folks uh, have uh, unreasonably high expectation from their democracy, particularly in comparison with their counterparts in other parts of the world. <clears throat> they think that uh, democracy you, will bring all good things to them. Okay, <clears throat> all good things indeed that uh, came to them, you know, very well in the past. Uh, Twenty years ago, they did not have democracy. <clears throat> but aside from politics, you know, they got everything there. Asia, of course, in the old days, I studied for the economy, I studied industrial policy. I, I knew it at the time, of course. You know, when I talk to the uh, the, uh, <coughs> my the counterparts uh, from the Latin America, they always say that, TJ, TJ you've got everything there. Okay, low inflation, high growth rate, good income distribution, very low uh, foreign debt, accumulation of foreign exchange reserve, and eventually, of course, leading to appreciation of currencies, allowing Taiwanese, Koreans, Singaporeans to come to Hawaii and so on, <laughs> purchase powers increase and so on. All right. In the Latin America, you have hyperinflation. Uh, you got sometimes stagnation, and so so all good things went together in the past. Somehow they got spoiled. It seems to me the third hypothesis say that today they are looking for all good things coming together for their politics. They believe that you know if they can create uh, economic miracle in the past, if they could do so in the past, they can certainly create political miracles today. High expectation. High expectation means uh, what? High, what? First, high level of frustration if you don't get what you'd like to have. Okay. <coughs> and it seems to me uh, to uh, solve the uh, use a little bit jargon here. In Asia, democracy somehow is treated like a quality good. Quality good is it's a concept we use in economics, <coughs> which is something that uh, you uh, can tell right away. Okay. But the uh, the democracy turns out to be an experience good. An experience is the opposite of quality good. Uh, if you go to a supermarket, uh, you know that uh, this apple is good. This apple is rotten. Okay, this apple is you know of low quality, and this one is high quality. You can tell right away, like a tomato and things like that. Okay, uh, you can tell on ex ante basis. Experience good is something like a used car. You don't know if it's good or bad. Okay, and there is too late. Three years under the experience. Okay, there is something is wrong with you know parking uh, with the uh, brake. That's all thing. You got to experience in order to discover you know the outcomes. Okay, democracy is to me is experience good. Democracy was not was not so well functioning way back in 1776, for example, in the United States or 1778. Okay, it took hundred some years something to perfect. Democracy is experience good. You know, where's, you know what's wrong with it, and then you improve upon it. Eventually, you, you make it better. Okay? Asian folks think that democracy is a quality good, not an experience good. Okay? Uh, experience good, of course, is something that will uh, watch out uh, the, uh, if you uh, Akarov, uh, the uh, I didn't put it here. Akarov uh, is teaching at UC Berkeley, he's Nobel laureate. He argues that uh, there's a kind of equilibrium uh, in the supplies and demands for the uh, uh, the uh, experience goods, like that kind of used car or something. Uh, we, as cons consumers, okay, we think, we assume that the goods is flawed, okay, but we cannot tell right away. Okay? Three months down the road, we can tell. But at this point, at this point of transaction, we cannot. Therefore, we are unwilling to pay a higher price for that. Uh, the seller, thinking that uh, you are not going to pay a high price for it, therefore, I have no incentive to improve quality, make it, fix it. I only paper it. You know, pass it over and make it look good, okay? And therefore, you've got, you know, sort of a low quality of support and uh, unwillingness to pay high price, and therefore, it's, you know, caught in some kind of low level equilibrium there, okay? 
and that's it. That's that's something. Yeah, it's good. Okay. Uh, we, I think, when it comes to democracy, I think this uh, experience good you know, can be improved. It can be self self corrected, but it needs time. And uh, Asian folks probably are very impatient. It seems to me. So uh, that's my sort of sort of hypothesis, and I'm still trying to figure out which one you know I would like to buy and I would like to promote. Okay. Uh, and after this uh, sort of the presentation, I want to uh, <coughs> go to the uh, sort of kind of a, a policy type of question. I'm going to raise that before I, uh, <coughs> I, I, I shut up my mind. Uh, the, what do you do when you have a sort of disagreements between we here as a sort of external referees and the, sort of the, uh, the customers there, okay? Uh, they come up with a very sort of poor report cards, you know, for their government. We come up with a very nice, you know, sort of report cards for the government. Which one would you go for? Which one do you think you know, we should indeed, you know, be uh, paying more attention to? Okay, should we say that you know they are wrong and we are right, or vice versa? Okay, uh, it seems to me that uh, in my view, uh, we are facing the problems. Freedom House. Democracy promoting uh, foundations in the Washington D.C. A national endowment for democracy, that sort of thing. Okay. Continue to say that. You know, listen, in comparison with other region, okay, Asian democracies are good. They are fine. They are just fine. But this kind of a comments is not endearing to the ears, you know, of the folks there in Asia. So what do we do? I don't think we can let them play. The only thing we can do here from afar is to figure out, you know. What kind of benchmark, what kind of thinking that you know, they have, they're going through? You know, how come they come up you know, with this kind of a very poor report card? We have to figure out their benchmark. We've got to figure out the yardsticks. We've got to figure out their expectation, which is why I present a sort of hypothesis here. <coughs> that's, the, that's my way of sort of, you know, sort of, kind of the, uh, <coughs> reconciling or dealing with this kind of discrepancies. Otherwise, you know, <clears throat> there's no way that otherwise you know, the two sides, we here and they there, will be talking to one another. All right, so that's my report. Well. All right, it's time for you to sell your old youth car now. <laughs> <laughs> qu we have ample time to, uh, to, do you have to go back to 2,000? I, I heard from the commandant that on Wednesday evenings uh, it's 20:30. So let's just say that's my hypothesis, and that's right. Okay. <laughs> so we have a lot of time. So question, please. Yes, please. Uh, so you seem to discount the institutional impacts and institutional persistence, especially if you're leaning towards hypothesis theory. Right. How do you discount that in your analysis if you're going to take it from a the third hypothesis. Good question, and I'm going to sort of take institutions sort of into account this way. Uh, it seems to me that the Asian folks there, uh, they believe that in, they they believe in uh, what I, how do I call it? Uh, <clears throat> initially, uh, upon getting democracy, I think they had too much trust on the institution. What institution can you know, can do? Okay, for poverty. Uh, they assume that, and this is empirically is kind of verifiable, that institution can lead to good behavior. If you think that uh, you are, you know, this uh, group of uh, folks uh, in, say, South Korea and Taiwan are corrupt, okay, we just crack, we crack our institution to prevent it, to correct it. Mm -hmm. So if we can just do something on the institutional side, institutional technically, it's really designing, that's all thing, we can, you know, indeed anticipate good behavior. They did that a couple of times. <coughs> I have uh, I have a papers and that paper got me in it uh, uh, quite a fan in the old days, but no longer I suppose because I argue that uh, the uh, Thailand is best case to illustrate that they uh, change their constitutions almost you know, every time after they have a coup. <laughs> <laughs> every time they have a coup, the military is of uh, uh, Hunda would commission you know a bunch of scholars like here, for example. Okay, and then they were writing constitutions. And uh, you know, it looks like you know they think that if we can just craft a new constitution, you know, we will have good government, right? Institution, blind trust, blind trust. 
Uh, institution cannot prevent bad, cannot you know, induce good. Institution, because we are all rational people. I mean, maybe you have passion for this nation, but if, uh, if you go to Capitol Hill, you know, everybody's thinking, oh, what can I bring, what kind of bacon that I can bring into my constituency? Okay. <coughs> and the, uh, they are going to distort or bend institutions in such a way as to suit their narrow interests. Okay. So we are not going to see an institution that is absolutely corruption or is of misdemeanors to approve. An institution, I believe, has been over tweaked, over, kind of, uh, over uh, uh, redesigned. Uh, eventually, people got fed up. Uh, take the case of Taiwan. We've got uh, some folks here with Taiwan background here. Uh, institution has been revised for seven or eight times. And if you look at it at seven or eight times, that constitution has been revised. It's for political reason. It's not that you can, you know, <coughs> you want to sort of kind of improve your uh, constitutional kind of uh, set up. All right? So, blind trust on institution, institutions and was regardless of, you know, are all powerful. It turned out to be that institution is very easy to design, uh, very difficult to sort of cry, but very easy to suffer. Too bad. <coughs> and I used to teach the uh, electoral systems. Uh, the, uh, and eventually I sort of the, uh, stopped teaching it because I think I was uh, probably, you know, <coughs> probably should not be using that word. I was talking nonsense or bullshitting. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> Initially I thought that uh, we need to know our institution, particularly either constitutional or electoral. Because we folks here, I've been to this country for some 20 some years. <coughs> naturalized America. We have only one system, which is single member districts and plurality. The numerous other electoral systems there we don't know. Europeans so about the uh, pro proportional representation, representation system, different variants. Okay. <laughs> Taiwanese, uh, Jordanians, and uh, say pre the 1995 uh, Japanese uh, single member transferable system, that's another in between. And also we've got New Zealand system, that's all I think. Eventually I discovered that. I thought that initially, I thought that, you know, if you have uh, this uh, sort of European sort of type of the electoral system, you are going to get a multiple party system. Therefore, uh, people like you and me, who are very sort of uh, environmentally conscious, you know, can afford to create the green parties, because the proportional representation allow us to have living space, right? Because the proportional representation basically means that if you have 50 some percent of vote, you are going to capture 50 some percent of seats. And we have only one system here which is called single member district priority. If one party, the Republican Party, captures a 51% of the vote in every single district, the seat distribution in Congress will be 100 versus the zero. Right? So we are going to have a swing this way, swing that way next time. So we got two party systems. Okay. Eventually, I discovered a lot of exceptions to that. Britain has American style so electoral system, they got three points. Okay. <coughs> the, uh, you have the uh, proportional orientation systems uh, somehow in Taiwan and South Korea, you got one dominant policy. Japan as well. So institutions, very difficult to cry, but very easy to, you know, sort of outsmart, bypass, affect. <coughs> Eventually, it boils down to your behavior, the value system, it seems to me. Yes? I had a question about. Uh, national satisfaction. You talked about the right. puzzlement between right. some objective factors and so on. Right. And I was reading an article mm -hmm. uh, recently, I think it's one of the European nations, Western Euro uh, European nations, mm -hmm. that proposing to actually measure government on the basis of national satisfaction. Mm -hmm. So there's been a lot written about that. Right. Uh, if, if you take a, like a composite measure and all mm -hmm. these things are rolled together and, right. and get a number, for satisfaction mm -hmm. in the countries that you mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, and, and looking at the economic versus the mm -hmm. uh, political mm -hmm. things, mm -hmm. how do you think it would turn out in, in terms of uh, yeah. ranking with other mm -hmm. with other nations? <coughs> it's uh, actually is a it's a booming college industry. <laughs> uh, it's a study of happiness, study of satisfaction things. Um, in the old days, I think the literature focused very much on the. Uh, some sort of material basis. Uh, later on, the literature moves, uh, moved on to include the, uh, uh, so to speak, the opportunity sets. 
your life chances if you like. Okay, uh, even you are poor, you know, you get scholarship to support your <coughs> to go to college. That sort of thing. Okay. <coughs> Nowadays, it seems to me that uh, a proper measurement, a proper metric, should include, you know, uh, the uh, questions and and dimensions that is to do with the uh, uh, the certainty, uh, predictability of your life. Uh, having gone through the uh, tech bubble first in two, 2001, uh, 2000, and then the 9-11 uh, uh, events in 2001, 2008, the uh, financial breakdown and some of the things. Uh, if I, I'm not doing that. If I were to do it today, I probably would use uh, the, uh, the uh, say, the insurance policies that uh, every on a particular basis as a measurement. To see whether this country or that country has you know, somehow uh, higher degree or low degree of anxieties you know, or uh, insecurity. Okay, the more insecure you are, the more insurance policy you're going to purchase. Okay, uh, having seen this kind of you know some kind of ups and downs and sort of things. Okay, people feel uncertain. Uh, they don't want to have uh, indeed sort of uh, a chance to maximize their gains. They just want to have a predictable you know something there. Okay. That probably will be probably the most important determinants of the uh, of the happiness, both on the individual levels and also on the subnational level. It seems to me, and the uh, uh, at the uh, at the uh, tonight's the uh, uh, dinner table with uh, these uh, prominent scholars here, I I I <coughs> I sort of identify a few countries there with higher degree of. Uh, High degree of uh, insecurity in Japan, uh, Taiwan, and perhaps Singapore as well. You know. These countries, they are democracies, of course. Uh, they are earthquakes, natural disasters, uh, the, uh, the uh, typhoons, and, the, uh, and Singapore is a small island in the large Malay seas, no sense of security because you are surrounded by Malays and so on. Okay. Uh, they, you know, they, they, they always try to conserve something. They always try to recycle. No, no sense of so kind of the uh, security. That may has to do with their dissatisfaction with the government. They think the government should reduce the degree of uncertainty. The government is probably not doing that. Probably exactly not Singapore. Yes. Do you think to add on to the question, you think this will wrap around like, the political rights and civil liberties <coughs> of these certain southern countries that are democratized in? Asia, like Singapore, Thailand. Do you think it'll be more wrapped around political rights or civil liberties? Uh, it seems to me that uh, we make a big point about the differences between civil liberties and political rights. Yeah. You look at that, you know, Freedom House is sort of, you know, the uh, measurement there. Uh, you can have civil rights that were protected there, but not democracy, not political rights. Uh, Pre-1997, the Hong Kong is a case in point. Uh, arguably, uh, China, you know, uh, you know, its Chinese government is granting, you know, a lot of, you know, higher, higher degree of civil liberty you know, to you know, Chinese society, but not political rights. So, uh, but uh, for these uh, seven uh, polities that I cover here, these two things are bundled up. Seems to me, are bundled up. And the, uh, it, I think the, uh, as I say, you know, my second hypothesis there is that all good things you should come together, or third hypothesis. So uh, yeah, they would not be uh, willing to indeed uh, settle it for, say, the Hong Kong type of things there, which is that you've got you know, civil liberties and you have no political rights or something. Uh, they think that you know, politics you know, should be able to deal with everything, including you know, happiness. Uh, uh, economic security and so on. And civil rights, it's part of it. So in again, coming back to my second and third hypothesis, they tend to see the whole thing interrelated there. And therefore, uh, of course, they would hold you know that guy's their presidents or prime minister accountable for everything. And uh, if uh, things are not developed and uh, not developed and uh, not delivered here, then of course you know you give that guy you know, low scores and things like so. So I, I again, uh, I defend my sort of third hypothesis there. I think people there probably have uh, unusual high expectation. Okay. Uh, it's, uh, in a sense, uh, you can argue that uh, 
it's very politicized. So everything you know, you know, should be somehow attributed to politics. So, <clears throat> but uh, we all know that uh, democracy is uh, <clears throat> means uh, limited government. Democracy and liberty means limited government. Uh, you you can blame government for everything, but unfortunately, that's the way of life. Even here, really, even here. I probably not answer your question more directly, but uh, I'm trying to model so we can see.